Welcome to the Date Forever podcast. Keep your relationship fueled up with strategies discovered by couples and experts. Because at Fuel Collective, we believe better relationships will equal a better world. You are about to discover specific insights and tools that cost little or nothing to implement to help you date forever. And now, here are your hosts, a couple who always have a half-packed suitcase and a date night in the calendar, Sammy and Nathan Yeager. Hello and welcome to Date Forever. In this week's episode, we're chatting about eating shit sandwiches and dealing with shitty situations in life, working through your shit and past traumas while in a relationship, and outsourcing and seeking help for your relationship when you need it. But before we get into that, Sammy, what's been fueling you up this week? Oh my gosh, I had such a big week this past week. Yeah? Yeah. I had uh, 90-day quarterly planning for Fuel Collective and Date Forever and one of the other businesses. (laughs) Um, So that kind of wiped out two of my days in what was already a short week because I was off on the Monday doing Tony Robbins. Yeah. So... I think my fuel up this week is my commitment and cadence with my yoga. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been feeling so good and I, I feel like I'm definitely going to hit my milestones. So the challenge I set myself was at least 30 minutes of yoga a day for 30 consecutive days. Yeah. And I'm very close. Getting and, close now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've got a week to go. So I think that I might just my body's feeling good and I'm starting to see um, some things that uh, uh, feel a bit stronger and just it's been a good practice for me to build in very conscious time for me to connect with myself each mm. day. Um, and I found it a good sort of anchoring thing to to connect other habits to as well. Yep. Yeah, so just feeling really good in my body. No, oh, that's really great. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What's fueled you up this past week? Uh, I think post Tony Robbins uh, is just kind of, been an opportunity to reflect back since we did UPW the first time around back in 2019 and just kind of, yeah, reflect on how much growth we've actually had over the past two years and what we've been able to level up. Back when this podcast was just a little (laughs) seedling of an idea. Yeah, that's it. Um, So, yeah, I think that's been the thing that's been filling me up, just to actually see how much we have actually grown in this past two years and seeing that things are still small but the potential is massive so um it's just kind of refuel some of the fire in my belly for the future and to and to do some more future planning because the past two years has been so amazing yeah even though we've spent 18 <laughs> months or more of it pandemic style yeah that's it <laughs> amazing uh, from a growth sense yeah. yeah let's say that but now let's introduce this week's guest Today we've got Annette Denshom joining us. With a gypsy as a mother, Annette sought refuge in stories. By the time she was 17, she had lived in 96 houses. The books in the library became her best friends and she immersed herself in tales of courageous heroes, incredible adventures and seeking knowledge about the world. It was no surprise when she chose to go into journalism, the perfect career for her inquisitive and curious mind. After decades of writing for major print publications and online magazines on topics from business and computers to seniors' issues and forklifts, she moved into PR helping people hone their storytelling skills. A four-time Grand Stevie Award winner, Annette is an author and gung-ho PR specialist who weaves words that move people to tears, to give generously to worthy causes and to educate, empower and inspire. Welcome to the show, Annette. Thank you very much for having me, Sammy and Nathan. Hey, one of the reasons we've got you here on the show today is you've got a new book coming out. I have. I have. It's, it's actually, it's out. It's been out for just Amazing. over a month. And it's, uh, it's called How to Eat a Shit Sandwich and Keep Smiling. <laughs> so, cheese. Cheese. And it's all about the first 25 years of my life. So, you know, relationships, abusive and not so abusive. You know, what it was like being a kid growing up in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, you know, what it was like to be a girl in those times and, yeah, really sharing where I've come from. And it yeah. sounds like a pretty crazy childhood too, living in 96 different houses or something. How did you even keep count? <laughs> uh, well, the, when I was 20, 19, I decided that I was going to join the police force. Oh, I don't yeah. know why. <laughs> I just decided that's what I was going to do at the time. And part of the application process is you had to write out 
every single place you'd lived in. So I mm. sat down with my mom and went, all right, let's start from when I was born. And so that, that was by 19. I've probably lived in a lot more now because, you know, I'm, as a young person I moved around a bit, but I'm pleased to say I've been where I am now for four years. <laughs> Just imagine the police officer, who you, the recruitment officer, who is reading that application going, what on earth? <laughs> It's probably why they didn't let me in. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your story without giving away too much of the book, but you had a gypsy for a mum. Yeah, well, my mum had really bad taste in men. So starting with my father, who was married when she met him and who attended the birth of my half-sister, even though it wasn't his child, and then left his wife and married my mum and then met another woman and left my mum and went with this other woman. So just from the get-go, I was three when he left. And so mum was just always moving houses. You know, she'd meet someone, we'd move in with them. That'd fall apart, so we'd have to move again. So, yeah, I got really good at packing my room up so if anybody's moving and they'd like some help, I'm amazing at moving. I think I'm one of the best removalists I know. So, yeah, so th- that was really challenging. And as, as a little kid, it's hard because we, I'd have to change schools. So by the time I was 10, I'd been to four primary schools mm. and I was always the new kid. And then when we moved from Tassie to Queensland, I had this weird-ass accent from being in Tasmania so I, I just got picked on so much. Mm. So I think the best move I've ever made was um, finding refuge in the library because it just fostered and grew my love of books, which is why I became a journalist and why I'm a writer because books can't hurt you. They just inspire you, motivate you, encourage you, educate you, uplift you. So that was a great place for me to be, hiding in the library with all the books. Nigel, no friends. Mm, and that sounds like a really, like, unstable childhood. Oh, absolutely. I th- that's an understatement. So. <laughs> yeah. I was like, um, that's a nice way to say that. Yeah, no, it was, it, was, it, it was fucked up. It was really fucked up because you'd just, you'd just get settled and then you'd be packing and moving again and you'd just make friends with the neighbour's kids and you'd be gone. You know, you'd just get settled into school And then you would be trying on for a new uniform. So it was, and I was really quiet. I was really shy. You know, I was like, I was a nervous kid because there was just no stability. And and I and I know as an adult now, I can look back as a mom and as a grown up and understand what was going on in my mother's life. But yeah, she made some really fucked up choices. And I guess as a kid, you probably didn't know that other people were doing it differently. No, because it was just life. Although I still, re- I, by the time I got to about nine or 10 and we, I was in the final primary school before I went to high school and I was able to make some friends and do sleepovers, I was, you know, I'd be sitting around people's dining tables you know, while mum and dad hugged each other and they talked about their days and they talked about their holidays and and thinking, oh, this is a bit weird. These Mm. people, like, are really nice to each other. No one's yelling. No one's going hungry. No one's, they've got really nice clothes and, wow, look at her bedroom. And so I I started getting an inkling of an idea then that my childhood was a little screwy. Mm. (laughs) Gosh. So what about writing the book? I'm a writer. It's been my whole career, you know, journalism, corporate comms, PR, and I I write. I've written millions of words about other people's stories and, you know, I always go, oh, one day I'll write a book and, you know, I got to 50 and I still hadn't written a book because I just kept getting stuck on, I don't know what to write about, you know, like I've I'm such an eclectic reader that I just couldn't narrow down the genre that I wanted to write in. So I was, you know, being 50 and being stuck at home, you know, we all know how screwed up last year was. Oh, actually, this year's probably more screwed up. But, you know, last year when we were in lockdown, I thought now's a really good opportunity 
for me to start. And I started thinking about why am I the person that I am? How did I come to be this person? And why do I have this outlook on life? What shaped me? And I thought, you know what, what have I got to lose? I'm going to write my memoir and, you know, share with people what makes an ad an ad and how, what things I've experienced that has made me the person that I am. So your book is called How to Eat a Shit Sandwich and Still Keep Smiling. So like what is a shit sandwich or like? So a shit sandwich is really just, you know, it applies to it's a, a corporate term, but in a life sense it's about the bad things that happen to you. So, you know, you sit down and you've got this big pile of shit in a sandwich. What do you do with it? You know, you just sometimes you just have to, oh, what a horrible thought, just <laughs> stick your teeth in and get on and get through it. And then once you get through it, then you can go back, clean up the mess or, you know, vomit or do whatever <laughs> do whatever it is that you need to do to get through your life. So I was just thinking, you know, about all of the, all of the things that had happened to me and it was like my business partner, Lauren, said, you know, you've eaten a lot of shit sandwiches and we were like, oh, my God, that's a great title for a book. I get to put swearing into it as well. (laughs) So, yeah, that's what it is. It's just life's little things that happen to you. Serves up to you, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't know if this is a curly question, but what's your relationship with your mum like now? Well, my mum's been gone now for 17 years, 16 years. The years before she died, we had a really good relationship because I forgave her. Life circumstances were what they were for her and especially as I became a mum, I just kind of went, like, I get it. You do what you have to do to survive Mm -hmm. and she did what she did to survive. So we were great mates. You know, I love her and I miss her today, even now. I guess she did a lot of things that screwed us up, but she did a lot of other good things that is part of the reason I am the person that I am. Like she taught me about being a hard worker. She taught me about being loyal. You know, she taught me about being resilient and tough. You know, those were things that I learned from her. So I'm grateful for those things and yeah I miss her every day you know there's often things will happen and I, I still 16 years later will go oh I ring mum oh shit I can't mm. so you know sadly she died of cancer I think she was glad to go because my life was hard hers was even harder so I think she was grateful that she kind of checked out a little early so, so you've eaten a lot of shit sandwiches in your life and experienced a lot of trauma along the way. So like, how have you gone about healing some of that? Well, in my 20s, it was called alcohol and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's uncommon, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. They were very beneficial and it, it kind of helped to numb the pain. But as I got older, you know, probably in my mid-20s, I went and saw a counsellor, you know, and started dealing with some of the stuff and talking to people and personal development, reading books and, you know, surrounding myself with people who would lift my energy and, for want of a better word, lift that vibration. You know, there were people who were working on themselves and, you know, you'd rise to meet them. So, yeah, that right, there was, there's no real secret. It was just, mm. okay, I, this is how I'm thinking. How do I change how I'm thinking and what do I need to do to do that? So, yeah, every now and again I'd go see a counsellor and I'll have a chat and say, oh, this is how I'm feeling. But writing a book I think was the best therapy. You know that saying, better out than in? Yeah. Well, that was writing the book. It was like let's just get all of this shit out, put it on a page and then Mm. move on. And there were times writing it where I was just sobbing and just, you know, I'd get to the end of the chapter and think, oh, geez, I have to stop for a while because that was really hard. So talk to my husband about it or reflect on it or maybe not meditate, but certainly sit with it and go, how does that make me feel? What do I need to do now to make sure that I'm not carrying that around? Mm. Because it sounds like even in the way that you answered that question about the relationship with your mom, it does sound like you're coming at that from a very healed 
and complete kind of place. Like it doesn't sound like you're harboring, you know, resentment or angst about that. And you said like, oh, you just go and do what you need to do. But I think there's a lot of people who don't do that work, who do stay very angry and very hurt, frustrated, or I guess those darker kind of emotions towards their parents and those experiences that they've been through. So was there something that happened that you went, oh, I just can't stay drinking booze and taking drugs and I want to lean into healing? You know, look, I think it was it was having a steady, stable, loving relationship that helped. You know, my husband Earl is totally polar opposite to the people I used to frequent with back when I was younger. So that that really helped a lot. It was like, okay, this is what it's like to be loved and mm-hmm. to love. And I don't know, it doesn't make me special or anything, but I just, I've always been able to look at something with the philosophy of it is what it is. Like, okay, that's really shit. That's bad. That's happened. I'm going to mull and fester and and rile and be in pain about this, but then I'm going to move on because I'd, I'd seen people who still, like I know someone, they're in their mid-60s and they're still hanging on to their pain of being in 20. And I went, and my mother held on to pain and suffering and guilt. Like she was amazing for guilt trips and emotional blackmail. And I thought, I don't ever want to be someone like that. I don't want others to feel bad because I feel bad. So I'm just going to deal with my shit as I go along so that it doesn't stick to me. Uh, but what I found I found really cathartic was probably about, oh, about 10 years ago, I signed up and did this entrepreneurial masterclass. And part of that was uh, four times a year you went somewhere for a weekend for Thursday through to Sunday or Monday, whatever. And they dealt with different aspects of your being. So one quarter it might have been about your childhood or about current relationships or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we did one around childhood and you're in a room with 100 people and the facilitator would really push you to open up. And they did this one session, it was called an anger session, and you lay on the ground And you lay there and you screamed and you thrashed about and there were people around you loving you and supporting you, but you're in a safe space that you could just scream. And it was one of the most cathartic, freeing, liberating things I've ever done in my life. And I did a lot of work around my father um, who left when I was three. So there was a lot of pain and abandonment around him, which showed up in the relationships that I had in my teenage years and early 20s. And it was, I couldn't talk afterwards. I screamed that much. But when I stood up, it was like, oh, my God, I feel like I've lost 20 kilos. Mm. I've just shed all of that. And it was amazing. So that was really the start of that journey of being able to go, let it go, Elsa, let it go. Let it go. (laughs) Wow. So you mentioned that part of the, I guess, the beginning of this and the snowball of this was feeling a, a love, a sense of love and connection from your your husband, Earl. So what did that look like in context of like being a, a partner or in a romantic relationship where you're moving through all of this kind of stuff? Actually, it wasn't as messy as what I would have thought it would be. You know, like he had his stuff, I had my stuff, but we just kind of came together with just this mutual respect and understanding mm. and this ability to just talk with marbles in our mouth underwater. So, you know, in our early relationship, we talked, you know, there was no secret that I kept from him. I shared everything that had happened to me. So he was really able to understand where I was coming from and I could understand where he was coming from. So I think like compared to all my other relationships where I'd always felt this sense of I can't let this barrier down, that there was a real, you know, release of, oh, okay, this is really good. He's listening to me. He's actually really interested in in what I have to say. And that was like, what? When I introduced him to my mum, her first 
words were, he's he's really nice. Like it was a question. <laughs> it was like, he's a bit it's too vicious. nice. Yeah, it's kind of like, that's what I'm looking for, Mum. I want a nice guy. Yeah, wow. So I think one of the things that I've come to learn, and I'm in my early 30s now, is that like I myself am allowed to be a work in progress and a masterpiece at the same time. And Nath is also allowed to be a work in progress and masterpiece at the same time. And I think sometimes I particularly hear it in like people who are still dating or they're taking themselves on and off of the kind of like dating market where they're like, oh, I'm just not in a place for a relationship right now. I've got so much going on with myself or whatever it is. Like kind of think like, won't we always be working through our stuff? I hope so. I'd hate to think that people would just stop. And I see it in business. I see it in life, those comments. I can't do that because I'm waiting for this. Mm. Or I can't do this because I'm waiting for the kids to leave home. Or I can't do this because, you know, I've got to wait for my husband to do that or whatever it is. And you're right. We never stop growing and we never stop learning and working on ourselves. And the day that we do that is the day that I think that we something dies inside of us mm. because we have to keep building this person to meet or match our partner or or even not. I mean, I know there's times in the 26 years that Earl and I have been together that I'm way ahead of him Mm. or he's way ahead of me and that we love each other to go, all right, okay, you're pissing me off a little bit with your whinging and your whining, but I love you enough to know that this is not forever. And I think it's sad when people put their lives on hold because they're waiting for the right time. I'm so glad I got to do air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think sometimes it is those imperfections that actually make a masterpiece too. Like if, if everything's so perfect, you don't actually kind of notice some of the details or like like nothing in, in nature really is 100% perfect either. Like it, it no. feels very unnatural for something to be completely perfect and and it's just probably not as interesting if it is perfect. No, well, you know, the, one of the smartest men man on the face of the planet, Stephen Hawking, said for the universe to have been created and to be what it is, things had to go wrong. There mm. is no perfection. You know, the universe isn't perfect, so why do you expect to be perfect? If we're always waiting for the perfect relationship, you're going to be waiting a hell of a long time because it's never going to happen. Or if you're waiting for yourself to be perfect before trying to enter a relationship, that's probably, well, no, it's never going to happen either. So, oh, you'll be very lonely because it's almost like you stymie the opportunities because you've got this. And I'm not saying at all that people should compromise their values when they're looking for a partner because that's really important. But, you know, I've seen some people with these checklists of what they're looking for or what they're working on themselves and I'm like, (laughs) good luck. It's going to take you a hell of a long time for you to be ticking all of those things off. Why don't you just do a work in progress? And and that's the beauty of finding the the right partner. I'm not going to say perfect partner, but the right partner for you is that they give you the space to allow you to do that and to grow. Yeah. Hey, so and now I'm curious, how did, um, when you started that kind of inwards healing type journey, how did that impact your relationship with yourself? I had to really let go of guilt and shame because I carried that around and, and I, carried it around for a long time, even through, camp, you know, it was, it was like deep, deep, deep guilt and shame. And by especially by writing the book and being able to get it out, I could look at it objectively and go, you know what, that actually wasn't your fault. I'm going to take responsibility for how I responded to that because that is within my control. But the circumstances leading up to that, it was almost like, you know, a car crash that you'll see it happening, but you can't wrench the reel over in time. That was always going to happen. So being able to forgive and move past that was very important, I think, too, because I thought I don't want to live the next 40, 50 years of my life just 
having this little niggle in the back of my head that I had done everything I can to be the best person I could be. Yeah, and that's a big part of why we called the show Date Forever and setting the intention to date yourself and intimately know yourself and heal yourself forever, like never-ending work in progress, which is kind of amazing, but then also really actively dating your partner. So I'd love to know, what are you doing for yourself now? For me, oh, well... Right, you wrote the book. Maybe you're taking I, a break. <laughs> but, I, but I have started planning my next one. But in terms of looking after me, I, I guess just to continue to have fun in life, you know, always looking for those opportunities where you can, you know, I'm really busy with work at the moment. It's award season. I write business awards. So I've got a lot on, but it's just finding those little moments where it's like this morning, it's sunny, it's warm. The dog and I are going to go sit on the front veranda with my shake and talk to the magpie. And we just sat there. We didn't poke our phone. Well, the dog can't park the phone. He doesn't have fingers. But I, I reckon he'd give it a go. If he could. <laughs> and we just sat there and just stared at the bird and looked at the sun and looked at the surroundings and patted the dog and was just in the moment. And I think to me that's the most important thing with self-care is grabbing those moments and mm-hmm. instead of trying to fill them, being able to go, okay. And I think too now that I'm more aware of how I'm showing up is that I try and stop through the day like I used to sit and eat my lunch. You know, I'd be eating and typing. So this afternoon I went made my lunch and the dog, because he's a scab, sat next to me. <laughs> yeah, he, he keeps he keep pokes his little nose under my arm and he looks up and goes, Are you gonna give me something? It's like you don't have a shape. beagle by any chance, do you? A Maltese poodle. <laughs> Our beagle yeah. is the most food motivated creature. <laughs> so is George. George can be under the covers in bed like you would think dead to the world, and one of the kids will come up and open the fridge and he's gone. <laughs> and it's like, dude, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Go back to bed. But now I stop and I eat my lunch. I mindfully sit there and I chew my food and I take half an hour and go, nothing is going to die if I don't get back in half an hour. I think that is like really important because you can get so consumed by the things that are going on around you and, and not actually take that time for yourself to relax and recuperate and just to realise, yeah, as well, that, that nothing is going to die. If you sit here and take half an hour to look after yourself. Yeah, and food tastes better when you stop and eat it. Yeah. Because mm. I was finding I was just shoveling. Mm. I was like, it didn't even matter what it was. I'd just go, okay, finish, get back to work now. So that's really important from a self-care point of view. And and I, in the last two years, I've been very pedantic about putting in holidays before I put anything else into my calendar. It's like little breaks. Let's go for a weekend here. Let's do this. Let's do a week here so that I don't get to the end of the year and go, what was the point of all that? I'm exhausted. Mm. Yeah. that's something that we've really struggled with so Nathan and I used to be really really good at that and putting in the calendar when are we going to take time out with the the mantra that our downtime powers our uptime but we had I don't know I lost track of how many trips and things we had cancelled over COVID and we've definitely lost lost that rhythm yeah lost and lost the respect for the time as well, where it's now like we've just worked through. When we were meant to be taking the time off, we just worked through it. And now it's been 18 months and we haven't really taken a proper break. So thank you for bringing that up because I think it is really, really important because it yeah. does get to the end and you're like, well, why are we doing this? Why yeah. Like- what, yeah. What's the point? That's it. What's the point if we're not, if we're going to work our butts off And we don't take time to enjoy that. And it can be as simple as a trip to Bribey Island for the weekend or to go out to dinner to a really nice restaurant and spoil yourself. 
you know, there's so many, like we, we, we live in, like in Queensland, there's so many incredible little places that we can go that are not impacted by borders mm. that, you know, we've got desert, we've got beach, we've got, you know, rainforest, that you can have those moments to remind yourself of <laughs> what you're working your butt off. Yeah. That's a really good one. So I'd be curious, you mentioned your husband and that you've had uh, an approaching a three decade long um, relationship. I'd love to know what are, what are the practices or things that you've got in that relationship that help keep it fueled up? Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think we just wing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we, I think one of the most important thing is recognising that when we do have a hurdle that we stop and find someone to help us through that hurdle. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I know there's a few times I've said, we're not going to get through this with the current thinking that we have because that's what got us in because mm-hmm. it's really easy to fall into that pattern of, you know, taking advantage and, you know, just, yeah, okay, they're there, they're always there. That's not always going to be the case if you don't work on that. I, I think the most important thing is to still have fun together is that we still have fun together and we mm-hmm. still make sure that we go and do things that are fun together, especially now that the kids are 17 and 20. Like we can leave them at home mm. for weeks and, <laughs> yep. and we won't get in trouble. <laughs> and hopefully they won't get in trouble. <laughs> they're, they're, they're pretty good kids. They We've left them quite a few times now and we come back and the house is not burnt down. And, and they're still you know, there. And they're still there and the house is tidy. It's like, okay, this is really cool. You know, both kids know how to cook, how to clean, so they can they can certainly fend for themselves. But Earl and I, one of our favourite things to do is go see live music, you know, go do wine tours, mm. you know, take friends or not take friends. So luckily this year we've been able to do that quite a bit because last year everything was postponed. So they've, like this Backing year we've... Up. Yeah, we've seen Midnight Oil, Ice House, you know, Grin Spoon, um, Birds of Tokyo. Like, oh, moving like, to Queensland is sounding really good right now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, not now. <laughs> Unless, of course, you like State of Origin. <laughs> You'll be fine. But, you know, we are on restrictions again. Live music's been postponed and you can't have parties, you can't dance. It's like, oh, it's pretty glum. But we still find ways to, you know, we've got a little brewery down the road is that, you know, we might go on a Sunday, take our backgammon border off some cards, have a couple of beers and just sit down there and talk and, you know, play a game together. So it's, it's the simple things. You know, it doesn't have to be complicated. It's yeah. really just about going, what do we like doing together? And let's keep doing that. Yeah, and making yeah. time to do that. Yeah, and look, luckily we both love Star Trek (laughs) and Stargate and those type of shows. So sometimes if we're tired, we'll just go back and watch reruns and then get excited about watching them again together, talk about, you know, Star Trek's awesome because it's all about a utopian world. And it's like, oh, imagine if this had happened. Imagine if we had that technology. And we also love um, zombie movies so we spend a lot of time planning what we do in a zombie apocalypse (laughs) (laughs) oh gosh i'm coming to you for the apocalypse plan hey i want to go back to something that you said at the beginning of that answer because i it really resonated with me and i think um it's a it's a barrier to kind of get through for a lot of people and that's outsourcing or engaging help when you need it and i think when it comes to romantic relationships, I don't think this is the default kind of thing. For some reason, we just assume that we're going to know how to do a healthy, happy, constructive, thriving relationship without hitting something that we we don't know how to overcome. And yet we've never done it before. We've never done it before, but we assume that we can do it on our own. So there's very few things that you would do that in your other in the rest of your life where you'd assume that you should just be able to figure it out. You'd go and get on YouTube or you'd go and find a coach or you'd go and, you know, learn how to do it. So I'm a big fan whether or not it's like getting advice and external coaching for your career or for your business or outsourcing things in your home if it's a continual pain point, get help. And that's the the same for like whether or not it's sex, whether or not it's like Whatever it is, there's a coach for that. 
oh, there's a coach for everything. And that's a really good point because, you know, if we look at what the divorce rate in this country is, even going back 20, 30 years, always hovered around the 50% mark. That's 50% of relationships that have broken up for whatever reason and the children of those relationships are learning how to relationship from people who have broken up. You know, like I had this kind of this conversation with the lady once who was telling me how to, you know, I was, oh, I was having a challenge at the time and, you know, a group of women, we were talking about it and she's like telling me how I should be managing it and like she, she's very forceful about it and I looked at her and I went, you know what, oh, no, it wasn't me, it was another couple. I remember this other couple and she was going, "They should, you should do this, you should do this. And I offered my advice having been in a relationship for 26 years and I looked at her and I went, aren't you divorced twice? <laughs> yeah. And she went, yes. What's that got to do with it? And I went, well, I don't know why you would give advice to someone and disregard my advice when I am in a happy relationship for 26 years and you've been divorced twice. No judgment, but you wouldn't go and ask someone, a mechanic who drives a broken car, well, they wouldn't be driving far if it was broken, (laughs) you know, to fix your car, would you? So it's like, you know, if, if you do need help, you go to the people who have the skills and expertise to do it, and most of us don't have that because we grew up in these fucked up families you know, like I would never go to my mother. Or I'd have to have a seance. But you know, <laughs> when she was alive, I would never have gone to her for relationship advice because she was married twice and had multiple disastrous relationships. So I always thought I'm never going to relationship like my mother. Yeah, and that's a huge part of why we started Fuel Collective is that we We observed a whole heap of our really close friends go through a series of really shitty breakups and in some cases divorce. And we were in our like mid-20s and now early 30s. And we know lots of people our age who have already been divorced. And we sort of observed that either one or two of the people in this these relationships had been brought up in homes where they hadn't necessarily seen a healthy, happy, thriving relationship modeled to them. And then they stepped into love and were trying to create something that they had no blueprint for. Because the blueprint we see is on television Mm. and that's made up. I I said I, I love Star Trek. You know, I watch it and the story engages me, but I'm fully aware that that scene that they've just done, there's like 15, 20 people off camera who are going, all right, make sure you look at the camera and go, you know, pull pull the <laughs> funny, starey face that they do in those shows or, you know, watching 50 first dates and going, oh, my God, that's so romantic. We, you know, that's where we're looking for relationship guidance from Hollywood and Netflix and Stan and Amazon and it's all just made up. So we do need to be reaching out to people who've who've got the runs on the board mm-hmm. and um, understand human relationships and interactions and things like that. Because, you know, the sad thing is, is I think a lot of people break up. Like I'm sure Earl and I probably could have broken up dozens of times, but those moments where we've gone, all right, that's it, I've had enough, we've gone to talk to someone and found that we still have core values mm-hmm. that are aligned you know, we still like each other. We, we're just frustrated because you get lazy. So, and that's what I see with a lot of these breakups is mm. if you'd just gone and asked someone for help, you probably could have worked through that. Yeah. But we're too tool. late. Yeah, yeah. add yeah, another tool absolutely. To the Don't necessarily uh, demolish the house when it could have just gone in for repair. Yeah, because cool you know what happens? You go and make the same mistake with the next person and then you're on your second divorce and you're going, I hate men or I hate women. They all suck. And it's like, no, actually, you should just probably dislike your communication style because it's not working for you. Yeah, Yeah. I think that's a really great insight. Hey, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today and for putting your story and your book out into the world. I'm looking forward to reading it. 
we've talked a lot about being the change and taking accountability for our own shit today. But Nathan and I also talk about being the change that we want to see in the world. So to say thank you for joining us, um, we've given access to a school uniform to a child in Cambodia for a month. So this is looked after, the project's looked after by an organization called Trailblazer Foundation. And that means that they'll be able to access education. So thank you so much for making that possible. Oh, you're welcome. I've I've done a little bit of travel through Southeast Asia and worked with the not-for-profit in the Philippines and and gone into those Mm -hmm. slums. And Mm -hmm. that's why I went that that's really important because the more that we can educate and empower people with knowledge, particularly you young people and young girls, the more change we are going to see in the world Mm -hmm. because poverty only exists because of a lack of knowledge and a lack of opportunity. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree. And the, yeah, the return on investment on a global scale for education is enormous. The ripple effect is enormous. It's one of the fastest ways we can pull people up, up and above the poverty line. So yeah. thank you so much. No, thank you. Good on you. That's amazing. So Annette, if people want to connect with you or learn a little bit more about your book or, or where can they find your book as well? I happen to have a copy right here. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> The cover is great. <laughs> yeah, designed by the incredible Haley and Brittany from B Inc. I've got to hat hats off to them. Those pictures are all of me at different <laughs> stages of my life. Not that I'm shit. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so you can go to my website, which is Annette Densham, D-E-N-S-H-A-M dot com, and you can buy a copy there. Um, I've only got physical copies at the moment. I'm doing a soft launch for the um, ebook in the next month, month and a half. You can connect with me on Instagram at Annette Densham. Pretty much type in an Annette, Annette Densham into Google and you'll find some way to, to get a hold of me, whatever your preference of social media or communication platforms are. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Annette. Thanks, Sammy and Nathan. You're awesome. Ah. Thanks heaps for joining us. If you love what we're doing here and want more, subscribe to the Date Forever podcast to make sure you never miss an app. Come and hang out with us and other awesome couples who are fueling up their relationships in the Thriving Couples Collective Facebook group or check us out at purecollective.com.au. Until next time, keep on dating because better relationships equal a better world.